next. Four urban explorers venture back in time to uncover the lost ruins of Pittsburgh. <laughs> Across the nation, the relics of America's past lie abandoned and forgotten. Factories, theaters, missile silos. This is the realm the homeless call home. A netherworld of rats and toxic waste. And these are the chronicles of the Forbidden Zone Expeditions. A series of inner treks to find and explore America's lost archaeological wonders and bring them back to life. This week's city, the home of steel, robber barons, Little Harlem, and tortured souls, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 100 years ago, Iron City was the fiery heart of America's industrial revolution. Today, the city is ripe for a renaissance and a playground for urban explorers. Site one. The New Granada Theater, where the team will learn what Louis Armstrong and Pittsburgh's deadliest natural disaster have in common. Site 2, the Duquesne Incline, a hillside cable car where the story of Carnegie Steel and the city's bloodiest labor riot collide. Site 3, Dixmont State Hospital, one of America's early insane asylums, and a place where a lobotomy could fix all that ailed you. It's a different side of Pittsburgh, one that will push the team to their limits and answer the question, who believes in ghosts? For our urban explorers, Pittsburgh's time capsules conceal priceless artifacts, each with a story to reveal. The urban explorers are Bryce Tupper, team engineer, Steve Duncan, team historian, and world-class climbers Brittany Griffith, and Timmy O'Neill. Stick with them and venture into hidden corners of the city that even the locals don't know exist. Yeah, good job. Big holes up here too. All right, sweet. Woo! Nice work, Brent. Hot five, bro. Come on. Yeah. All right, Thumb wrestle. Yeah. <laughs> what are we looking for? The New Granada Theater, the Duquesne Incline, Dixmont State Hospital. Let's hit this thing. You guys ready for Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania? Is it ready for us? Oh yeah. We got a dun, 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 dun. Cool. Cool. Oh. New Granada Theater. Yeah, See nice. it live tonight. <laughs> We're going up to the Hill District to check out the New Granada Theater. The Hill District is a historically black neighborhood, and uh, the New Granada Theater was a center of culture during the Jazz Age. All the greats played there. I'm really excited to see it, but it's been abandoned since the 60s, so I'm not sure what kind of shape it's in. By the 1920s, the Hill District was predominantly African American, and it quickly became a center of black culture, nicknamed Little Harlem. These humble streets became the stomping grounds for the jazz elite. Everybody who was anybody during the jazz era played here, from Ella Fitzgerald to Duke Ellington. It's around here, I think we should, uh, I think it's right down here, in fact. It seems like that's probably the marquee. The team will have to take extreme caution. The building is a structural death trap. Yeah. Hey guys, Timmy's in! I'm in, Brittany. The rotted floors are notoriously unstable and the roof is partially collapsed. But it's worth the risk. The shattered theater is a portal into a vanishing part of America's past. The New Granada Theater is important because it was designed by Louis Bellinger. Bellinger was one of only a few African American architects working in the early 1900s. Actually, that's a pretty big understatement because out of 20,000 architects working across the country in the 1920s, only 60 were African American. Doug. Yeah? Great. Yeah, let's move it. Let's make a plan. Bryce this? and Steve are on a mission to find relics of the fabled Savoy Ballroom and unearth the story that linked jazz great Louis Armstrong to Pittsburgh's greatest natural disaster. Timmy and Britt decide to head out into the neighborhood to find locals with stories about the New Granada Theater. Right, guys. Stay in touch. 
Good yeah. luck. So 1927, right? It was built originally and then... Yeah. What was Tithian the year? Temple in 1927. So what was the deal with the, the temple, Duncan? Well, the Knights of Pythias were an uh, African-American fraternal order of construction workers, about equivalent to the Masons. Yeah. When this was set up as a cultural center, it functioned as a community get-together, as kind of a union organizing site, and also as a place for entertainment and dancing. And they had a kind of a banquet hall and yeah. drill room on the bottom floor. I think that was what was converted to theater later. Oh, and then on the see. second floor, which maybe is where we are right now, now, they had this uh, kind of giant auditorium that had a basketball court as well. You're saying this is the, the ballroom area? Yeah, it should be. It started out as a basketball oh, yeah. court. This place started out as a kind of formal men's club, but the Depression hit Pittsburgh pretty hard, and the Pythians had to sell their building in 1937. Almost overnight, it became this wild night spot with a movie theater on the first floor and a lavish ballroom on the second. Renovated the, place. the ballroom became known as the Savoy. The temple to the, hey, heads up. And look, this you can tell this is all the old floorboards from the ballroom and the basketball court. The yes, rotted uh, out floorboards are probably a relic of the Jazz the Age ballroom, but Bryce and Steve are looking for more vivid clues to the grand room's past. Yeah. All right, come on, let's do it, Brittany. Timmy and Britt hit the streets and almost immediately find what they're looking for. We, we found this park. The locals called it the Wonderful Park, and it's this plot of land that they've really taken care of. They've planted flowers and put sculpture there, and they have their tables where they play dominoes, and they talk, and they just spend time together. I'm from Oregon. Originally, I'm from uh, Iowa. Right. I've been there in St. Louis one time. That's a hot joint, St. Louis. Yeah. St. Louis. I went yeah. through this one. Have I ever been in the building? Yeah. Yeah, I've been in the building. Uh, Did you ever catch any shows inside? Well, see, I'm a little younger. You would have to ask somebody. We have to go to the older crowd, to, huh? to, to a senior man. Oh, looks like he's over here hanging uh, out right now. Now, see him. He would know more about. Well, cool. Well, thank you, Ricky. Anytime. All right, awesome, man. Mm -hmm. Who would you have coming in that would play downtown and then come up here and play for y'all? Any jazz musician in the 40s coming through here. Oh, really cool. Yeah. Yeah, Max, so Max Rhodes. Huh? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Part of the fabric of the hill. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Well, the place we're standing right now was actually kind of the cultural center of the most prosperous African American community in the United States in the 1930s. Because of the racism, they weren't really allowed to engage in the cultural activities of the rest of the city. And up here, I think, was where people came to dance. In the 20s and 30s, there was actually no other venue in Pittsburgh where African Americans were allowed to dance at all. Even the black jazz greats who came to play in Pittsburgh's famous nightclubs downtown were not allowed to stay at the swank hotels there. Instead, they stayed in black-owned hotels on the hill and jammed late into the night in the many jazz clubs. Was it up here that they had like all the cool musicians play or was it downstairs? Yeah, yeah, Ella Fitzgerald, was it here? Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington got the name King of Jazz right here apparently. Everybody played this ballroom. Count Basie, Lena Horne, a young Sarah Vaughan, Dizzy Gillespie, Ella Fitzgerald, the list goes on. One exception was the legendary Louis Armstrong until Pittsburgh's greatest natural disaster changed that. Our urban explorers are uncovering the decayed past of one of Pittsburgh's hippest night spots, the New Granada Theater. In the second floor Savoy Ballroom, Bryce and Steve are searching for clues to the lavish room's jazz era past. Watch out, look at this. Some of the best in jazz history played here but it took a terrible natural disaster to bring one of the greatest. Actually, I think Louis Armstrong only played here once at a benefit for the 1936 flood. It inundated oh, yeah? Pittsburgh. Yeah, when you see pictures from Pittsburgh of that, of 1936, it was St. Patrick's Day, and it just came up the second floor windows around the point. On St. Patrick's Day, 1936, Pittsburgh had suffered a long snowy winter and days of heavy rain. The Ohio River, swollen to its limits, burst over the levees. Within 24 hours, the downtown was covered by 12 feet of water. In 
Entire buildings were swamped. 46 people lost their lives, and the city sustained $250 million worth of property damage. That's an awful lot of money at a time when the average steel worker earned only about $370 per year. Louis Armstrong came to Pittsburgh to play a benefit for the flood victims. He played to a packed house and lived up to his immense reputation. It was the only time Armstrong played in the building. Look at that. Look at the S up there. Oh, Savoy yeah. Ballroom. Bryce and Steve yeah. find what they're looking for. Even after all the years of decay, the bold S of the Savoy has survived. Who were some of the acts you saw there? Oh, some of the people or movies you see? Dave Brown. You Dave did. Brown. Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. The Good last boy. movie I seen in there was Superfly. Yeah. Okay. How much was it? How much was the ticket? Do you remember? Well, it was 55 50, cent. 50 cent for adults, 35 cent for kids. Uh, <laughs> can't even get coffee for that. When I started. <laughs> New say? Granada Theater, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, nice. admit one. Really? This ticket good only on date purchased and when the submission price applies. 35 cents. Nothing's changed. Bryce and Steve continued downstairs and reached the bottom floor that housed the New Granada's massive movie theater. Duncan, look at this. When the theater was operating, it could fit over 500 people. If I were to choose a way to walk down there, I might go to the aisle. Bryce heads down what remains of the aisle to see what's left of the movie screen and stage. Let's see if it's still working. Oh, yeah, it is. OK, Dunk, put a show on, man. I'm in the third row. Misguided redevelopment in the 1950s and race riots in 1968 contributed to the decline of the hill and its cultural heart, the new Granada Theater. Wow, look at this, it's crazy. You can see, you can see through the roof. Look at those joists, those wood joists, every floor. I think, honestly, all this stuff fell down from up above. Yeah. The toilet seat, there's doors, probably fell down from the side, there's a... If the people of the hill want to restore or rebuild the new Granada Theater, I think they have their work cut out for them. The water damage was some of the worst that I'd ever seen, and the steel was so badly corroded, you could reach up and just pull pieces of the beam apart. Uh, I don't think there's much structural integrity left in there. But I do think that there's a chance for the facade and the marquee to be saved, and hopefully they can do that and then return the theater to its rightful place in the heart of the community. There's not a lot underneath here. Yeah, so I'm guessing Bryce and Steve have made it as far as they can. The center block and drop it ahead of us. You want to do that? The back of the well, building is too damaged to keep right. exploring, so they head out to meet this Timmy and Britt. Give me feel goods over here. But yeah, even amongst the rubble of the new Granada the Theater and the Savoy Ballroom, they've been able to catch a glimpse of the building's <laughs> jazz age past. Fellas! Oh, man! What's up? Finally! How was it? Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, do you guys want to cruise over and yep. check out the incline at all? Don't, yeah, you what had incline? something you really wanted yeah. to show us. The incline! Oh, I don't want right. to go. That's going to be real it's touristy. Good. We'll peel off to the incline and you can do whatever you want. We'll, we'll hook up with you later. All right, Duncan, have fun. As Bryce, Timmy, and Britt head over to the Duquesne incline, a historic hillside cable car system, Steve strikes out in pursuit of Pittsburgh's story of steel. The story of steel in America is in many ways the story of Pittsburgh. With easy access to huge coal mines and three rivers vital for transportation, the city was uniquely situated to produce steel in quantities almost unimaginable before that time. I figure while I have the car, I'm gonna go check out Homestead. Homestead was the site of one of the largest steel mills in the area. It had about 8,000 employees there in the 1890s. Andrew Carnegie's steel plant at Homestead was one of Pittsburgh's biggest and is infamous for an 1892 labor riot that turned into one of the bloodiest days in Pittsburgh's history. I think it's one of the most exciting stories in Pittsburgh. When the contract for the workers came up for renegotiation in 1892, they decided they wanted to cut their hours a little bit. They were getting 12-hour shifts seven days a week. Every two weeks, they'd flip to a night shift by working 24 hours straight. Carnegie refused to negotiate with the workers and hired 300 Pinkerton agents, private security guards, to break the strike. The Pinkertons came up the river on barges, and when they tried to land, the strikers met them on the riverbank. A 12-hour battle ensued. The strike was eventually broken when the Pennsylvania militia was called in by the governor. 
it was really a landmark in labor history, and uh, the mill itself was a pretty magnificent structure, and I'm hoping to be able to see that as well. Maybe I can convince the others to come over and explore it a little bit. Bryce, Britt, and Timmy have arrived at Site 2, the Duquesne Incline. This car up, we're going up, we're going up, this car up. <laughs> Built using 19th century know-how, it's a marvel of form and function and helps to tell the story of Pittsburgh's steel age. You guys see this? Whoa, we're missing it. Though inclines seem novel today, they were born out of necessity. Built on seven steep hills that wreaked havoc with horse-drawn carriages. To solve this problem, the city turned to the railroads, and by 1900, there were at least 14 inclines servicing Pittsburgh. We're at the top of Mount Washington in Pittsburgh. Join us. To find the connection to steel, they're going to have to get down into the engine room, deep in the bowels of the station. Hey! Excuse me. Hey, you think we could come down and take a look? Yeah, sure. Come on down. I'll turn around. Luckily, the team runs into Tom Reinheimer, a wellspring of information about the incline. Hey, Tom. Oh, oh, Glad to meet you. Uh, come on in here. I'll show you what makes the incline run. Let's oh. check it out, dude. This sounds awesome. That's the main hoisting drum. It's a big drum. Most of what you're looking at is original. That is the original drum. As of today, it's 127 years old. And you'll notice oh, we, have, we, we have two cables. Uh, we have one yeah. cable that unwinds from the top that lets one car down. Yeah. And the other cable beneath the floor here, if you can see it, takes the place of that cable as it unwinds. Oh, yeah. Therefore, you it's only need one drum one. instead of two. The 900-foot cables made from Pittsburgh steel are able to support at least 50 tons, 20 times the actual burden of the two cars. They are uh, rock maple teeth. Rock maple? They're, rock uh, maple? Rock Wooden maple. teeth? Why wood? So it runs a lot quieter, but it, it's very hard. They don't wear out as fast, actually, as metal. At the height of its use in the 1880s, the incline carried about 6,000 passengers a day. Well, while here. Bryce, Timmy, and Britt check out the city's living history, Steve is about to discover the place where a Pittsburgh river once ran red with blood. In Pittsburgh, the team is split up to check out different sides of the city's Steel Age past. Bryce has taken Timmy and Britt to explore one of the city's famous hillside cable cars. Steve is seeking artifacts from one of the deadliest labor riots in U.S. history. Well, we're here where the old steel plant used to be, and really there's nothing here now except them all. It's really disappointing, nothing at all to explore. They did manage to keep the old smokestacks, which is nice. It gives a sense of how big this place used to be. But I'm going to walk down by the river and see where the barges landed. Steve hasn't found any evidence of the infamous 1892 steelworkers strike, but he can imagine the scene. Strikers on the Ohio Riverbank shouting insults. Barges full of Pinkerton strike busters approaching the shore on orders from Pittsburgh's wealthiest steel tycoons. It was mayhem. The strikers were throwing sticks of dynamite and they were shooting pistols into the barges. The Pinkertons were firing back with pistols and rifles. Ten of the strikers were killed and three Pinkertons died as well. The Pinkertons actually ended up surrendering to the strikers with the promise that they wouldn't be hurt. But when the Pinkertons came ashore, the strikers went back on their word and just pummeled them. The place was flowing with blood. Well, there's nothing left of the old steel mills at all. But while I was down at the river, I saw this creek coming up to this pipe. It looks more than a century old. Let me go check it out. A little bit of the underground of Pittsburgh. These tunnels were vital to the Carnegie Steel Plant, draining the watery sludge created during the steel making process into the Monongahela River. God, this place is fantastic. I love these underground areas. They're just a network underneath the entire city. You can tell these places are old. They have little uh, lactites, calcium carbonate, and rust coming through the old concrete. Pretty cool. Uh, it's falling in a little bit. You can tell that the concrete's really old because of the big pebbles it has. 
still looks pretty solid though. I'm hoping to find areas where the concrete pipe meets other types of pipe. Then you can see how they combine systems from different areas. You know, like uh, if we find brick or, uh, or, or um, hand laid stone pipes, then we know that those are from the 19th century. As Steve goes deeper, he can tell from the rough stone walls that the tunnel is getting older. My theory about this place is that the part we're in right now actually dates from before the Homestead riots, probably the 1870s when they first built the steel mill. While Steve continues to search for the remains of Carnegie's steel plants, Tom takes Bryce up to see one last secret of the incline's connection to Pittsburgh's steel heritage. So you think that all the steel is cast iron or just the machinery? Uh, well, come on up here. i got something interesting to show you. If you recall, I told you that this place was timbers when it was first built yeah, in 1877. And in the 1880s, they redid it again in iron. And one of the neat things is to show you how old the place is. Yeah. Uh, in 1901, Andrew Carnegie sold his steel company to J.P. Morgan. That if you look at this beam, Carnegie. it says Carnegie on there, which puts it back uh, beyond the turn of the 20th century. So this is like the small window where Andrew Carnegie he yeah, was a total steel mogul. He started it, right? Yeah, right. And this is one of the pieces that probably one of the only ones that still exist of his. Tom, that's yeah. amazing. The Carnegie name here back on the steel is something that I didn't really expect to see when we were down here because from what I understand, Andrew Carnegie, even though he was instrumental in bringing steel to Pittsburgh, he only really had the Carnegie name in the steel manufacturing or his business for probably 20 years before selling it to U.S. Steel. So this right here is a really cool connection to Pittsburgh and its history. Pittsburgh, Carnegie, and steel. It's impossible to separate them. By 1900, Pittsburgh was producing well over 50% of the nation's steel. Its furnaces ran 24 hours a day and employed tens of thousands of workers. The industrial might of the city had a dramatic side effect. The air was so polluted that day literally turned into night. Pictures show that they had to light the street lights in order for people to see during the day. Women actually walked around with masks over their face when they shopped as well. And it took the decline of the Pittsburgh steel industry to clear the air. Back in the tunnels, Steve continues searching for older sections that would have run under the Carnegie steel plant. So I could get a little deeper. Here we are in another section, again a really old section. You can see it's made out of brick. And the reason I know brick is really old is because it had to be hand laid. This can't be done with big machines. It has to be an individual person putting down each brick and plastering over it with the, uh, with the cement. They normally build things like this about three layers deep, about three bricks deep for the arch. The others are off of the decaying incline. That's a bit of living history that people get to see every day. But this, nobody else is ever gonna see it except maybe a couple of sanitation workers. They're never gonna turn it in a museum. No tourists are ever gonna come through here. So I'm seeing something that no other visitor to Pittsburgh ever has. Pretty cool, huh? With this last piece of Pittsburgh steel story in place, Steve heads off to pick up the team and set out for their next objective. Ahead lies the decaying ruins of an abandoned insane asylum called Dixmont State Hospital. So what's, what's they used to have really kind of barbaric treatments. Lobotomies and electroshock therapy. It's said that one unlucky inmate screamed so much at night that she was chained in an outhouse hundreds of yards from the main hall. Who believes in ghosts? Raise your hand. I do. There's a pretty good chance of there being some tortured souls in there. And anything, I mean, anything goes wrong, I want a blood curdling scream. <laughs> the urban explorers are going into an abandoned insane asylum, Dixmont State Hospital. It's a hulking mass of a building lurking on the outskirts of Pittsburgh, ready to swallow up anyone stupid enough to enter. A blood curdling scream. Here, the team's mission is creepy, but simple. Find the asylum's morgue and come out alive. They've got reason to be scared. 
Dixmont was home to Pittsburgh's most deranged mines for over 100 years. Dunk, you ready? Let's go. The asylum started as a sanctuary for the insane, but over time, it saw some terrible practices, from sensory deprivation to shock therapy. Throughout its history, the asylum walked a fine line between genteel haven and house of horrors. I really didn't want to go in there alone. That place freaks me out. Despite Dixmont's proud origin, Pittsburgh's residents are raised on dark stories of its terrible history. Everyone knew if you went crazy, you went to Dixmont. To find Dixmont's morgue, the team splits up. Britt and Tim will start their search through a second floor window. Yep. Stephen Bryce will seek out the miles of tunnels rumored to snake beneath the entire complex. Okay, Sounds good. good luck finding ghosts. Dunk, I got something oh, nice. over here. Manhole. Oh, that's perfect. There's a huge series of tunnels around this place, isn't there? Yeah, connecting all the main buildings. Bring your light over. Nice. Yeah, oh wow, that's nice. Yes. That's, what, 10 feet, maybe? And that uh, tunnel goes right in there. I know, those will be access to every building around here. Here, you think this is long enough? Yeah, that'll help anyway. All right, you want to hand my bag down after I yeah. go in? Can you hang now? Yeah, good. I'm kind of psyched on seeing the building. Before 1850, the treatment of insane patients was, well, insane. The mentally disturbed were feared, misunderstood, or ridiculed, and their treatment reflected these attitudes. They were kept in cages, locked in stone cells, put on display for the public's amusement, and kept with animals and pens. In the mid-1800s, things began to change because of social reformers like Dorothea Dix, who inspired the construction of Dixmont. Dix's crusade started with a visit to a prison in Massachusetts where the insane were housed. She witnessed atrocities such as prisoners being shackled to walls, being kept in bitter cold cells, and her compassion led her to question these practices. So she asked the guards. The guards responded by saying that the insane don't feel hot and cold, therefore it's irrelevant. Well, she didn't believe this, and this is basically what led her along her crusade for the humane treatment of the mentally ill. Dix pushed for asylums where patients could perform useful work and be treated by doctors and nurses. Dix mental institution. Cool. Are you all freaked out? Um, yeah, I am actually. I have to admit that it kind of definitely sketches me out. Yes, I'm Stephen Bryce wandered the maze of tunnels that connect Dixmont's building, searching for a way into the main yeah. residence hall. Yeah. At its height, Dixmont had over 1,400 patients and thousands of employees. The hospital had more than 20 buildings spread over 400 acres. You know, the places that had a thousand or more patients and were state funded, a lot of times they were built away from cities and they had their own gardens, their own water treatment plants, reservoirs, their own morgues and cemeteries. Dixmont had all of those things from the very beginning. And so it was a totally self contained community. And it became a world of its own, you know? Patients would come here, they wouldn't know anything else. They'd be here 20, 30, 40 years sometimes their entire lives, you know, they'd come in as children and, uh, and die here. So there are two buildings, two main buildings he was telling us about. And the left one, which is the one I think we're in, has the cafeteria in it. You're insane. Bye, Brittany. Timmy! Don't, come on! Don't! Tim! Yeah. Brittany will soon realize her worst fears come true. Lost in a deserted madhouse in the dead of night. 
Our urban explorers have infiltrated a site that gives nightmares to Pittsburgh's residents, the abandoned insane asylum, Dixmont State Hospital. While Steve and Bryce are trying to find their way out of the asylum's underground catacombs, Timmy decides to go off on his own. Oh, you're insane. Bye, Brittany. Timmy? Come on. Don't. Britt's worst nightmare is realized. Timmy! It's hard to really imagine what it would be like to be a patient at the Dixmont State Mental Hospital. They shut it down in the mid-80s. And I'm actually inside a patient's room right now. But it's not a very big space. Room for a bed, a radiator. There's no latch on the inside of the door. It seemed like once you were in your room and they shut the door, you'd be like a prisoner. Locked in. If you can only see. Okay, when I first came in the building, I was a little... I was very afraid of things falling on my head. When we came in, bricks and... And the ceiling and the floor was dropping out. We had to go over this rubble pile, and that was uh, pretty frightening. But right now, I'm a little more freaked out about just uh, stuff. I'm pretty sure that pretty sure that was Bryce or Timmy trying to scare me. But I'm pretty sure that this floor was was the where the patients lived. Because it looks like the doors lock. And I know I. Oh, God. Sorry. What is this? We should have brought a compass. <laughs> this was the timeout chair. The timeout chair? Hey, you know, I actually I did hear that they sometimes chained patients down this... in the tunnels. Really? Yeah, when they were just too intractable, too violent, they would bring them down here and lock them to the pipes. Crazy, right? Chaining patients in the basement was one crude method of restraint. Others were more sophisticated. Leather cuffs could be attached to a patient's legs and arms to restrain him to his bed. The famous straitjacket kept violent patients at bay. The most extreme the Utica crib encased patients in a coffin-like wooden cage. It was supposed to have been a better place to be if you had a mental problem because they were using progressive treatments. But there were still things like lobotomies being performed here and electroshock therapy and cold water immersion. Thing that, that frightens me is just kind of the, the oppressive atmosphere. When you realize the, the, the number of atrocities and the, num the amount of human suffering that occurred in these walls, it's, it's hard not to be freaked out. This one seems to reverberate with the most human vibration, I guess. I wonder what stories these walls could tell, that door could tell, this floor could tell. Tuesday, May 1st, 1906. William E age 21 years, was forcibly remanded to Dixmont State Hospital. For months, he suffered from the terrible hallucination that he was being pursued by a swarm of bees. After emerging from the tunnels, Bryce and Steve still haven't found the morgue. 
they decide to split up to cover more ground. Everyone on the team is now wandering the halls of the asylum, alone. This is kind of freaky. I think this is one of the tunnels that connected the main building to the dietary building, which was the dining hall for the doctors and the patients. But the story goes, actually, that uh, um, there was a nurse that was really hated by the patients just for his brutality. And uh, one day, basically, they just got him alone and beat the shit out of him. And he had to crawl on his hands and knees from the main building when patients were housed over to the dietary building before somebody noticed him and you know, found him and took him to the hospital. Friday, March 6th, 1896. James F., demented and violent, has threatened the destruction of his family and friends. Remanded to Dixmont. One side of the building was dedicated to men and one was dedicated to women. And as you moved away from the center, which is usually the administration building, usually got um, to patients that had a worse and worse condition in terms of their insanity, I guess, if you will. So I want to keep moving to the outskirts of the whole building in order to get to the rooms where some of the more sick patients were. Friday, November 24th, 1899. Dennis M., while insane last week, attacked his wife with a hatchet, cutting her down and beating her face into an unrecognizable mass remanded to Dixmont. Dixmont wasn't just home to the truly mad. At different times, anything from alcoholism to postpartum depression could land a person here. But life in the asylum wasn't always a nightmare. As they were using progressive treatments, treatments that involved gardening, expressing your creative side through the creation of arts and crafts, they had patients draw murals sometimes. You can still see traces of them on the walls. So it looks like we're pretty much at the end of the building the main Reed Pavilion in the Dixmont Asylum here. I guess right here would be probably where the, um, the sickest or most crazy. It's a full moon tonight. Just to add to everything else, full moon is historically a marker of insanity. The time when the rational rules don't apply. And the worst is yet to come. In the dead of the Pittsburgh night, our urban explorers have infiltrated an abandoned insane asylum called Dixmont State Hospital. Timmy! The team has separated to scour the main residence hall in search of the morgue. Cheerio, but I found the basement. Jesus. That's nuts, man. I, I stepped on a light bulb. Yeah. And it went, bam, and it scared me. Yeah. Right? After getting a good feeling for the building, Bryce and Steve reconnect. I need a second wind. Neither has found the morgue. Yeah, hey, did you see the bars on the windows? Pretty iron work, but not just going metal, right? What, what do you think? It stopped patients from running at the windows? And, yeah. Both teams decide to head outside to see if they can find the morgue in one of Dixmont's other buildings. Soon, they will come face to face with a part of the asylum's past best left forgotten. A bridge to nowhere. Here's Johnny. Ah, oh, for sure. You should call those guys. Yeah. Just down the driveway from the hulking corpse of the main hall, Bryce and Steve stumble into another building. Stevie, Stevie, are you there? We see some lights in the building and we're wondering if it's you guys. We hope it's you. 
Septic place, probably the infirmary, the hospital. Hey, if this right, is the right. infirmary, do you think the morgue's downstairs? It could be. So we'll check. Did you guys find it? No, we when we came through, we didn't see it at all. But we pretty much came straight up here. Yeah, cool. Yeah. But you guys, what Let's else have it. you guys been doing? What did you guys find in the other buildings? Anything good? Facts. This is kind of weird, huh? This place has kind of more of a patient, mental patient type feel to it. Yeah, these were definitely hospital rooms. Look There's at this. Some operating rooms around. Here. It's the type of place where Dixmont's doctors might have performed the dreaded lobotomy. Can you imagine this little place filled with four patients and maybe a crowd of little doctors and interns? Oh dear. Somebody over here, you know, two big hulking guys holding down the patient, one on each side. It's hard to believe, but Steve's dead right. During a lobotomy, a specially designed tool was used to sever the prefrontal lobe of the brain. Even seasoned surgeons found the procedure difficult to observe. Neither. By the end of the 1950s, the lobotomy was rejected. Look, this is where you pick up your drugs. Well, we're open for business here at the uh, Dix Mont Mental Institute, and as it says right here, pills here, get your pills. So line right up, folks, to get your lithium, your Thorazine, or your Prozac. Starting in the mid-1950s, the development of psychotropic drugs like lithium and Thorazine allowed patients to live in more mainstream settings. With many fewer patients, the need for large asylums vanished, and Dixmont was shuttered in 1984. Oh, you guys, I found the morgue. Finally, Bryce finds what they have all been looking for. It's the end of the line. Hold on one second. That's kind of nasty. The social stigma of having relatives in an asylum was so bad that some patients' families refused to acknowledge their existence, even when they died. A Dixmont administrator received a letter from the family of one deceased patient stating unequivocally that they would not pick up the patient's body and to please never contact them again. The team has seen enough of the morgue. Eager as they are to go, they'll never forget their dead of night journey through Dixmont's decayed ruins. The end is near for Dixmont, actually. They're gonna turn the asylum into a super Walmart. Attention, Super Walmart shoppers. You can pick up your straight jackets and tongue depressors on aisle nine. It's 6 a.m., and a gray dawn breaks over Pittsburgh. The crews explored all of their objectives. Now they are eager to head to their next destination. All right, thank you, Pittsburgh. The Urban Adventures are out. See ya. I got my sign. I got a plan. Yeah, come on, little help, little help. Get down.